Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with the latest financial news from the rural heartland here at home and around the world. In this edition, the global face of terror. Osama bin Laden is killed by U.S. Navy SEAL Special Forces on Monday, hiding out at his mansion in Pakistan. How are world markets responding? The world wants more biofuel. That's more pressure for global agriculture and more of higher prices for corn, a major input into global livestock production. Is it good news for our grass-fed systems here at home? And with many experts picking the Kiwi dollar to go from strength to strength, how much will our export prices suffer? The latest inside info from those in the know. All this and plenty more coming up, but kicking off now, we'll start with ASB's latest rural economic update. Here are just a few of the trends it's picking. The New Zealand dollar could hit 85 cents against the greenback by year's end. The dairy payout will be around $7 in 2012. Lamb prices are holding with low supplies keeping prices high. And the U.S. beef market remains strong but needs a careful watching brief. Joining us now to tell us more about our strengthening dollar and the Australian's record-breaking dollar hitting a dollar ten against the greenback is ASB rural economist James Shortle. And James, what about that Aussie dollar? Oh, I mean, a dollar ten. I think there's going to be some Aussie screaming uh, at those sort of levels, particularly their farmers, because they're they the ones that are really going to be suffering. They're, they're the ones that are going to be exporting um, in that kind of market, but um, not not receiving the same benefits. Now, how high are your bank strategists picking the Kiwi dollar to go? Well, to be honest, it's not good news uh, for some particular sectors with, with what the what the dollar is going to do. We're picking that the that the currency is going to lift to around 85 cents later on this year. Uh, when you say later on this year, how quickly? By around September. So this is you know three, four, five months uh, away. Um, and, and the key reasons for that is that out of the US, we're still seeing a, a lot of support for their economy uh, financially from their central bank, but also commodity prices here in New Zealand, that's bumping along. That's the reason why we're seeing the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, but also the Kiwi dollar strengthening. But it's really going to hurt our export prices. Well, I think it's going to be, it's interesting because it's going to be uh, important for some sectors and not for, and, and not for others. Uh, dairy prices in particular, then they could actually uh, increase because when you think about the currency, it's a, it's a medium of exchange. Uh, so, you know, Chinese consumers still want to buy dairy products, and they're, 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 the yuan is going to provide X amount of, uh, of buying power. So, we could actually see a lift in, in US dollar denominated dairy products um, because the US dollar is weak. But, but on, the, by the, on the other token, um, we've got beef prices that could actually uh, that could actually suffer a little bit because we're exporting to the US market. Yeah, and you're picking some negative trends coming through. I know, for example, in Texas, terribly dry pastures there. Uh, uh, that's hurting them. Well, to be honest, I've been quite positive about the US beef market for a while and also positive about uh, about New Zealand prices leading into next season. But to be honest, I'm getting a bit nervous about the, about the situation at the moment. And the reason for that is, you know, April was going to be a, quite a crucial month for, for the US beef market. They're starting to change their seasons. They get through to Easter. Um, and when they get to the other side, they start to get the barbecues out, so that sort of thing. But uh, to be honest, um, prices have actually decreased quite significantly. And consumption is down. We've got pork and chicken, the big competitors of beef. And much cheaper alternatives. That's right. They're much cheaper. And, uh, you know, when you've got a, a consumer that's really feeling the pinch of paying a a lot more for fuel, that sort of thing, then, uh, you know, consumption of beef is starting to look a little bit uh, a little bit more down at the moment. Now, what are you picking for lamb prices? Well, I think lamb's going to continue um, continue where it's uh, continued on the good levels. Um, the key thing to watch for is the, uh, this is the strength of the pound, and we're probably going to strengthen against the pound also, unfortunately, and that could take a bit of a shine off the prices. And I think, uh, you know, we could, we've, we've been exporting a lot to, to the UK as our traditional market, but we're actually starting to see more demand going into the Middle East and some of these emerging economies um, and they do have the buying power at the moment so it'll be interesting to see if we see more of a shift over to those markets over the next few years. Now of course the world wants more biofuel and that means they're going to be growing more corn and using that uh, not to feed the animals of course but uh, uh, to put into our cars for goodness sake. Uh, how's that going to affect us uh, moving out over the next year for example? Well I think the biofuel phenomenon is one that's going to stay, stay around for 10, 15, 20 years to be honest and that's going to really change agriculture and food around the world. World. So over the next over the next year, we're seeing around 40% of uh, the U.S. corn production going into biofuels. That's really having a, having an effect on on the amount of corn that can go into livestock production, but also lifting the price.
price. So, you know, the last week we've actually started to see that the milk to milk to feed ratio out of the US, which gives a good correlation of what it actually what farms get paid versus what they uh, what their input costs are, and it's starting to get a little bit squeezed. So, dairy farmers, you know, when that happens, they may start to think of think twice about increasing production. James, thanks very much. Stay tuned. We'll come back to you. Coming up after the break, dairy exports to China help push exports to a record monthly high in March of $4.5 billion. That strong demand for protein from China is driving record milk powder, butter and cheese exports. And the sweetest success story of the week, a Hamilton company with a new natural calorie-free sweetener does the deal with British sugar giant Tate and Lyle. Look out, world. Plus, sharpen your pencils. You have until May 20th to put in your bid for a slice of the new $850,000 government giveaway designed to drive more profits out of the red meat sector. But first, answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What percentage has annual agricultural lending growth dropped, according to the latest figures from KPMG? The answer when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what percentage has annual agricultural lending growth dropped, according to the latest figures from KPMG? The answer, lending has dropped from 7% to 2%. Well, the whole world's talking about the killing of Osama bin Laden on Monday in that Pakistan compound. We want to know how it's affected equity markets. Joining us now is National Business Review editor Neville Gibson. Neville, you've been following this closely. Uh, what's been going on? Well, it's had quite an interesting effect on the money market. Uh, initially, the US dollar went up and then it went down and it's gone down a little bit more just, just lately. But the price of oil has dropped and uh, some instability in the Middle East has obviously been factored in. I think the markets take the view that uh, his death is a good thing and it's going to get rid of uh, one big worry for the US because the turmoil that's been going on in the Middle East is not really related to the terrorist groups, it's related to uh, the struggle for democracy and freedom. Now we hear that dairy uh, prices uh, and dairy exports have really boosted uh, our overall trade figures uh, for March. Uh, James, uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, I think dairy's been one of those ones that's been been tracking along pretty well for for a while. But we can't f we can't also forget about um, uh, beef prices, sheep prices, forestry prices because they've all boosted um, some pretty good export results uh, over the past 12 months, I think. And it's probably something that we're going to we're going to continue to see. Except the story's not going to be you know one of growth because prices have probably plateaued a little bit where they from where they have been. And it's not going to be one of growth either. I mean, we're being wiped out by our very strong Kiwi dollar. Uh, is there any way around this, Neville, that you can think of? Not really, except that uh, March is usually not the strongest month of the year, May is, so uh, maybe it's going to get even better. And there's certainly the uh, trade balance has now improved very much in the uh, farmers' favour. And the Reserve Bank, certainly without the dollar going up even further, see that this is going to be locked in for quite a while yet. Neville, uh, you've been watching food commodities and you think uh, that there still could be some rises in the prices, but you're picking it's levelling out somewhat. Talk to me about that. Well, we, ha we have seen some levelling out in certain commodities. The one that went up uh, this week was coffee, but that's not really a, an important one because coffee is a small ingredient in the price uh, you pay for coffee, but it's, uh, it's one of the only ones that it's actually spiked in price. A lot of the other sugar and so on has actually been coming down. All right, let's talk about some good news, gentlemen. Success story of the week, maybe the year, maybe the decade, Bio Victoria. Uh, what's going on there, Neville? Well, this is uh, a purchase of uh, a, a big shareholding in a New Zealand company that's developed a technology to develop a, a high-quality sweetener that does not have calories. That's a fruit grown in China called monk fruit. And this was a, a really a, a high-class company, but a couple of years ago when they tried to do a, a listing on the stock exchange, people didn't want to know about it. But it's still owned by New Zealanders with some Americans in there. But Tate and Lyle, a big uh, UK company, it's been moving out of sugar commodities into what they call specialty ingredients. It's probably the second largest in the world in that area and it's taken up the special deal to market the monk fruit product for five years. That's a huge step forward. Now this is a fascinating tale for me because it's kind of like the little company that could. Uh, we didn't want any part of it here at home but they didn't give up. They went out and had a global uh, quite aggressive campaign. They went to the United States, James, and, and, and won from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, the OK to use this sweetener. And guess what? Uh, the rest of the world has recognized them. Is this our loss here in New Zealand or is this our gain? 
Oh, I think it's our loss, uh, to be honest. I mean, there's, we've seen probably seen that type of story um, happening quite frequently, I think, in the, over the last couple of years. And it's um, we've seen it already with other companies coming and buying some strategic assets w from us in the, in the past mm. few months. Um, and you don't have to argue that. While it's you know it's it's a, it's a shareholding, it's not a as far as I'm aware, it's not a, it's not a major shareholding. We haven't lost a company. At, at Correct. All, at I think it's a 12 one. percent uh, shareholding. Yeah. yeah. So this, it's not it's not significant, but um, at the same time, it's uh, it, it is it is a part that's leaving our shores and some the, of the, the important thing is that Tate and Lyle have explained the deal that they they don't want the calorie free market so that which is where Bio Vittoria was originally going but rather in reduced calories so they're widening the entire range of ingredients in, in the food industry so you're talking billions and billions of dollars all right let's talk uh, about something a little more sobering banks of which of course you are employed James uh, KPMG's latest study shows that lending is way down for all of the banks and farm lending is really in a sorry state Neville it's been a huge drop if you look at it graphically, but uh, it's, um, you know, business lending is even negative. <laughs> so 2 per cent is quite good. Business lending is negative, although it's come up. The problem here is that uh, about 80% of uh, farming is quite safe and uh, they're keeping their debt down. 20% is in trouble. The main sector that's in trouble, though, is the wine industry, and the, the banks certainly are wanting to get out of lending to wineries, especially the non-big uh, corporates. You know, they, the small wineries that have spent a lot of money converting uh, or stepping up their production and in dairy conversions. But it uh, looks like the banks are holding off there because you know, while dairy prices are up, they're not calling in the loans. Uh, James, uh, what should farmers be taking away from this uh, study? What does this tell them? Well, I mean, it's interesting because uh, we've seen a small growth on an annual basis, but actually in the month of March, then there was no growth at all. There was 0%, 0 lending growth in agriculture. But to me, that's not surprising because uh, dairy farmers are repaying a lot of debt at the moment. And particularly the last few months, we've seen an increase in the Fonterra payout. And there's been some massive, massive checks coming into uh, to dairy farmers in particular, which, of course, house probably 65 to 70% of the total debt in, in agricultural uh, markets. So... I would actually be, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, we'll see decreases in overall lending over the coming few months because we are in a position where we're seeing strong payouts and a real willingness uh, from farmers to repay debt. The, the bad thing for the banks is they've got more money they know what to do with. Their assets are at a record high and they can't lend the money out and the margins they lend at are because of a com competitiveness of the market and you know, for our borrowers, uh, they, their margins are thin. Well, that's great news for John Key because apparently he's borrowing more and more money this week, even as we speak. <laughs> when is it all going to end, Neville? Well, that's um, that's the uh, sovereignty issue. New Zealand is a good place to lend money to. We've got a very good record in repaying debt, and obviously uh, there's a lot of countries around that are in um, deeper trouble than we are at the sovereign level. And uh, that's what the lenders are looking for, is uh, good countries that are prepared to pay the money back. So you're not worried about, uh, about be worried. Uh, borrowing be at the moment? You think John Key's doing, doing the right thing no, going I don't. offshore? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm very worried because I think you know, if you go back 20 years when we were borrowing a lot, there was a big government deficit. And uh, that's what the uh, Don Brash has made that move. And there's a lot of people in the business community and probably in farming as well who actually sort of see that the election now might be about that debt issue and to try and you know, scale down the government's view of how much money it should be spending. But here's the question. Uh, it, it's fine for the backroom boys uh, and Don Brash to, to, to realise this, but what about the moms and dads? Uh, uh, are we ready to come to grips with, uh, with what's going on? James? Probably not, and that's um, something that uh, we've seen overseas too. I mean, the, the, with the elections over the past two or three years, and we've seen governments really get hammered on this particular issue, de government debts, and you know, Germany, Ireland, particularly now it's happening here in New Zealand, and um, I think there's still pro probably a lot of people with their heads in the sand. That this, it's not such a big issue. So we need to be looking at places where we can sell more of our food, correct? We're all agreed. And you think it could very well be Japan. Uh, talk to me about that. Well, Japan's in an interesting position because they've, they've got an, a really big crisis there. If they're food security, food safety, New Zealanders have been hammering on the door there for two years trying to get some sort of trade deal with the Japanese. There's been very little movement, but finally it's really happened uh, and the Prime Minister is l leading it in Japan. The uh, agricultural sector is likely to tone down their protectionist stance. There's a meeting coming up in uh, Tokyo in June, and the New Zealanders are being uh, you know, revved along by the Chamber of Commerce and others to really get in because there's a big opportunity there to lift our exports. 
It's a very good market. It's been very steady over many, many years, but we need to get that extra step up. Yeah, and in Japan now, I see that the uh, Japanese Prime Minister has just passed uh, the emergency budget. They're picking now that uh, to recover from the quake and the tsunami, it could be, and, and of course the, the nuclear crisis, could be 300 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, uh, meantime, what are we doing about the quake here at home? The Japanese quake in terms of their economy is actually much, much smaller um, than what the earthquake here in New Zealand is versus our economy. So it's going to have a much, much bigger well, bearing. Which is hard to believe because they've had, what, 10,000 people dead, uh, another 15,000 missing. I mean, the human cost is incredible, but ironically, uh, we're doing it tougher here. That's right, that's right. And something, it's something that we forget when we, when we talk about Hurricane Katrina, that had an even smaller effect on the U.S. economy, whereas it had devastating impacts on some of those communities. But in, it, in it seems to me that Japan is, is moving so much more quickly, Neville, than we are here. We're still looking internationally for somebody to come in and, and, and lead the rescue effort. Uh, uh, how much longer can we drag our feet? Well, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult issue, I think, because uh, Christchurch is probably one of the uh, places where you wouldn't expect that kind of step forward, in my personal view. You know, if it happened in Auckland, I think things would happen a lot more quickly, but uh, it's still a very large and important part of the economy. And a lot of the uh, exporting activity is not affected, so that's, it's mainly going to be how much are people going to want to rebuild in Christchurch, how much can that city get its... Uh, a lot of that business back again. Going back to Asia now, uh, and it was interesting in Japan to see those farmers protesting in uh, Tokyo. Uh, this is so un-Japanese to go public. Uh, they're really worried about their agricultural industry. Uh, uh, James, what are you hearing? How bad do you think it is likely to be for them? Well, I guess um, so far, there's, there's, there's some of the indications are that um, you know the exports and agricultural exports or uh, exports into into Japan, then they um, they, they do have big bearings on uh, on particular markets. But it's surprising that some of the critical milk uh, is, is is quite an, is uh, already um, they have self sufficiency in, in, in some ways, we're around 70% self sufficiency. Um, but they need to import a whole lot of a uh, lot of corn and um, to feed their cows. So that's going to have wider impacts on on the whole sector around the world, in particular for grains which of course right now are very low in stocks. Speaking of Asia, James, uh, you sent me a fascinating article about uh, all the deal makers now uh, getting involved in, in uh, food companies. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, well, there's a lot of a lot of deal making going on around the world. Of course, uh, last last week we had um, you know the French getting into uh, the Italian uh, dairy company, trying to create another big merger. We've seen the Brazilians in the meat industry around the world creating massive massive companies. But we've also seen plenty of activity out of Asia. So they're a little bit you know the, the key reasons why we're doing well now because they want our food. But they're getting a bit concerned about what that means for them long term, and they're creating funds and investment opportunities to go and buy and make sure that they have that food security going forward. So there's plenty of activity. Well, one of the companies is Agria, which is a kind of deal maker out of China, which is a bit busy in, in New Zealand. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. An interesting thing with our own companies is Goodman Field, a big trans-Tasman company, which uh, whose share price is going down. The chief executive uh, retired just the other other day and hasn't been replaced. And it, But the problem for our food companies is they've got the supermarkets, both in Australia and New Zealand, screwing them the price at one end and the cost of commodities and food items going up on the other, so they're being hit by a double whammy. But it looks like Goodman Fielder could be an easy target for a big company out of Asia. But the Japanese companies are a little bit traumatised at the moment, so we're not seeing a lot of activity out of Japan. Normally they'd go and buy a company like this, no problem. So watch this space, it ain't over yet. Coming up after the break, future proof. What our experts will be tracking over the next seven days, where are they headed? But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How much did our dairy exports to China earn in March while helping push our exports to record highs? The answer when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, how much did our dairy exports to China surge in March, helping push our exports to record highs? The answer, dairy exports to China were up 177 million bucks in March. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up that our experts will be watching? We've got to talk about the latest government giveaway, James, $850,000 to stimulate, allegedly, the red meat industry. What's your take on it? 
Well, to be honest, the, 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 the things that I've been reading about it have been quite um, loose, I guess, in terms of detail, and I'm not completely sure what, what, the, money's, what the money's for. Um, what we do know is that the red meat strategy, um, which has been facilitated by Deloitte, is going to be released over the next week. Um, so I'm assuming that it's going to be um, off the back of some of the announcements through that, um, and it's, uh, you know, the idea is to drive new efficiencies and new product development. But um, you know, where that's going to come from, I'm not too sure. Now, Neville, meantime, there are new players in the meat industry. Uh, tell us well, more. Well, there's certainly a big new investment by Silver Fern Farms. Remember their uh, beef plant burnt down in the Waikato. Correct. And now they're going to replace it with a huge new plant with all the latest, uh, and they say there's going to be a lot of new technology in there. It's the biggest investment in the meat industry in probably over a decade. So I think there's a lot going to be resting on that one, mainly for beef, but it's going to restore all those jobs there and consolidate their other activities there. And they also bought a big chunk of uh, the Wallace a corporation as well, so you know that's there's signs of really good, strong advance in the North Island meat industry. So, do we, being the taxpayers, really need to put our hands back into our pockets and give them another what, eight hundred fifty thousand bucks to figure things out? Well, this is probably a bit of a boffin money. I don't know quite where it's going, but certainly when uh, Silver Fern Farms can come up with these sort of numbers, you're talking tens of millions of dollars. Uh, that's pretty big. You know, big spend versus less than a million on some research and marketing. James, uh, what else are you going to be watching now over the next seven days? Well, I, I looked at my calendar this morning and uh, Good of course, thing too, because <laughs> you're right. coming on the show. <laughs> that's right. And I mean, it's quite scary that it's May. And, uh, you know, when you think about some of the uh, events that typically happen in, in May, we've got a budget that's coming up. <laughs> and we've also got uh, Fonterra payout is usually announced for the next season sometime in May, sometime in early June. So. I think those are going to be quite, quite big, uh, quite big events that we've got to keep a pretty close eye on over the next, over the next few weeks. What are you picking on the budget? Well, I think we're, uh, we're going to have to see some pain, to be honest. Um, you know, we're, we've already started to hear, hear some noises about some of that pain, and it's going to have to come through in some of the some, some different sectors um, in order to make sure that we're able to pay, pay our debts back and to uh, reduce those interest costs and also to, um, to facilitate, you know, the rebuilding in Christchurch. So there's been a whole lot of things that are happening, um, but I can't actually put my finger on exactly where those cuts are going to be made. Uh, I don't think the government's been exactly rushing um, uh, to give us the pain, Neville, have they? No, and, and the pain's not going to be felt by ordinary consumers and taxpayers. It's going to be felt by people who work for the government, and it's going to hit the public service. You've got now uh, quite a number of large government departments where there's effectively no chief executive, so they've got a, they're in a position to make some major changes there or put some people in place who really know how to uh, scale down the public service, and that's going to take out quite a lot of money. And a lot of people who are dependent on government programs are also going to suffer. John Key, meantime, is just back from, of course, the royal wedding, but also dropped into Paris and met with the French president. First time there's been that kind of high-level contact in four years, apparently, uh, looking for trade deals. Uh, how do you think he's uh, well, It's, it's he's shocking that we ignore that France and Germany are two of the world's largest uh, exporters, uh, very important econ economies and very important large-scale businesses, you know, almost as uh, f figuring, if you put the two together, they equal to Japan. Japan in our terms and uh, we pay them very little attention but uh, the French trade minister she's a very good speaker of English educated in the United States and you know you can talk to these people without knowing French and, and certainly getting there and it was good to see him so shaking good. hands with the president there. Absolutely of course talking rugby I am sure. <laughs> rugby is going to be a big thing it's a big thing for the French and we're going to have a lot of them out here and uh, I think they are uh, and, and French are of course big players in the Pacific and we should not ignore the fact that they do have a global role uh, in the French speaking world. So John Key has a lot on his plate the budget rebuilding the economy rebuilding Christchurch and uh, wooing all these world leaders uh, it's got to be tough. And winning the World Cup. And winning the World Cup. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. Always great to see you. Thanks to my guests, ASB rural economist James Shortle and NBR editor Neville Gibson. We'd love to hear your feedback, so be sure to check out the website. Meantime, we leave you with these pictures of the tornado that tore through Auckland's North Shore on Wednesday, not far from our headquarters, and the words of Samuel Richardson, the English writer who once famously said, calamity is the test of integrity.
Keep the Faith. See you next time.